thanks. Thank you all for coming. Does that work? painter who can regularly be seen showing her work at art fairs throughout Indiana, including Penrod, Broad Ripple, Carmel, Fourth Street in Bloomington, and Art on the Wabash and Round the Fountain Art Fair. So if you've missed her, you probably haven't been going to any art fairs. <laughs> <right. laughs> um, Anne earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from DePaul University in Arts and Secondary Education. She's also an experienced and popular art instructor working with children and adults in, uh, in uh, drawing and painting. Uh, her winter course here at the Art Museum called Oil Painting was a palette knife. <laughs> and she, she's a professional at that. She was, is sold out, and I think that started this week. So um, you'll have to wait till the next class if you want to take a class from Anne. She's exhibited in the Hoosier Salon and shows in Indiana cities, including Terre Haute, Muncie and Rensselaer. Her exhibition, Moving Lands, is an exciting set of paintings that focus on the flora and fauna of the prairie lands. This show features paintings that were created in oil and cold wax with the use of a palette knife. And if we have a microphone, <laughs> can, you guys, can you hear me in the back? Okay, okay so we'll have to just like... This isn't that. church, you can move up. <laughs> My dad always said that. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so I, about five, four years ago maybe, started talking to people I knew in the arts who said, I wanna have a show at the art museum. You know, at the time I was probably doing pastels. I started, when I first started doing this, I started with pastels. But anyway, they, you know, I, I said, I, I really would like that. And, and Kendall, bless his heart, he said, okay, you can have a show. And I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> now what do I do? Um, so I 
had to think about what am I going to paint? You know, what I want it to be cohesive. And I started, I was thinking nudes. You know, I thought that'd be kind of fun. There's a figure drawing class here, which I never get to because I never leave my home. <laughs> so I really did think I was going to do. I remember telling Michael, I think I'll do, I think I'll do figures. I think I'll do figures. Maybe nudes, but maybe not. But some figures. Now, ended up with flowers, um, just because I spend a lot of time outdoors. And in fact, I was out in the fog, and Dan Anarano rode by, and Luba. And they came back and said, a plein air painter. <laughs> and I knew who he was. But I said, yeah, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard in Indiana to do this. But I'm out, I run, and I bike. And we have the wonderful fog, all the trails. And for the last few years, it kind of comes and goes, but about four years ago, the flowers were incredible. And then it was kind of bad last year. And this year they were incredible again. And they were just so, it's just so much fun because you just don't, someone said once, where do you see all these flowers? I'm like, there, they're in the ground. They're there, you have to stop and you have to look at them and take their picture and you know, they will smile for you. But I decided to do flowers and it was a challenge because I paint animals mainly. I like animals, they're kind of my, they're my thing. And so I thought, well, I've got to give these flowers the same personality that animals have. But we were lucky to have what we have. So anyway, I start out, I do lots of little studies, and this is what I paint with. At my shows a lot, I say, I use a palette knife, and people go, what? And I said, you know, a palette knife. It, it looks like a little, a little um, spade, not spade, what are they called? That you, spatula, or a, yeah, yeah, trowel, trowel. I'm like, they look like a trowel. So I actually have a picture. I mean, most of you guys know what a palette knife is, but I started with brushes and it just, yuck. Don't use turpentine, it's bad for your brain cells. I need every brain cell that I have, every single one, I kid you not. So I started using palette knives because all you have to do is wipe them off. So basically I do this because I'm lazy and I don't want to clean brushes. I just don't want to deal with it. I took a class from, um, Oh, hmm. Michael Sloman, David Sloman. He's he's an Indiana artist. And he's uh, really an abstract artist now, but he used to do real realism, beautiful stuff. And he, you know, he was always. Well, why was I talking about that? Oh, 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 oh. He wouldn't let us have any any turpentine or any kind of medium in the in the class. We're all like, well, how are we going to clean our brushes? And he he make us use cooking oil. And it works, it works. Oil takes oil out. Oh, I, I have to get that over here. Oh, because you can't, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Facebook Live, <laughs> Facebook Live. So not, they're just gonna hear me, not see me. But anyway, so we use cooking oil and that's a mess. So I just decided to do this. And it's so, it does take some, some skill. It takes some practice. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, a lot of people lay it on kind of like butter or mm, cake icing, something like that. Um, I use pretty much one size palette knife. Some people, you may make big ones, but I just use kind of one palette knife, just again, because I'm lazy. I just don't, I want, I get into what I'm doing and I don't want to have to change anything, but it's really, people do like the, the, um, the texture that you get with a palette knife, some people, but I do get that a lot. Oh, love the texture, love the texture. So I use uh, cold wax, which is like uh, Crisco, I mean, it really has no smell. It's very nice. It has, it's a medium, but it has no toxic smell to it. So I, I mix that in with my paint. I've got several students from my class here tonight, so they know what I'm talking about. Um, and it gives a lot, of, a lot of texture. It helps the paint dry faster and also gives it the exact same sheen. So, so you know, some paints will dry shiny and some will be dull and, and, and this stuff will make it kind of all the same sheen so it's like eggshell instead of glossy, you know what I mean? So these are some new ones I've done. This is a plein air. I think this isn't the one that Dan and, and Luba saw me painting, but um, it was in the, plen I joined the plein air, Indiana plein air association, but I've never painted with them. I just joined so I could put my, <laughs> my painting in one of their shows. Don't tell them, <laughs> don't tell them that. I'm going to do things with them this year. So I always say, <laughs> people say, if you can't do it, teach it, which is not true at all. I say, if you can't do it, teach it, and you'll be able to do it better. 
because what I learned, I was an art and education major, but I didn't teach because there just weren't teaching jobs. Everyone wants to be an art teacher. I was a little clue, clue in on that. Um, so I started teaching and I got better at drawing. And I always tell my students, you do have to draw. I do think it's important to learn to draw because it trains your brain. You know that drawing on the right side of the brain thing, that was a big thing. And it's, there's a lot of truth to that. You, you just can't just all of a sudden be a good drawer. You gotta train your brain to not think like your human brain. Because we have human brains that, that want to simplify everything. Person, stick figure, flower, flower. You know, and, and, and if you don't train your brain not to, not to do that, you'll automatically draw things easy. Because when we were like animals, we had to run away from things. We had to know if they were good or bad. And so our brain had to kind of figure out really quickly what it was, whether it was a threat or a, this is what I read somewhere, really I did. <laughs> um, and so when you train your brain to draw, you have to train it to look at things completely differently. Take my class and I'll teach you how to do that. So I have so much fun. I, I send these to my students. Like I had so much fun with this basket of eggs. I always challenge myself. So we talk about things like no tan, which is like using just black and white so that you can see a composition. Um, then I show them composition things, and I just love those silly ducks. So I said, you know, this is like a gesture drawing, like they're moving, and there's some, there's some great lines in this. And, and then you start talking about all this stuff that you're supposed to remember from school that you don't. <laughs> I don't remember this stuff, but I now find that it's very important to know it if you're going to be teaching people. So we talk about the elements of design, and, and I always say, well, the elements are the ingredients and the design principles are what you've cooked. I just told my class this at the end, like we just heard this. But, um, so it's nice to know that stuff, because then you can talk about art. It's really hard if you just say, I just don't like it. <laughs> you know, when you do a critique, it kind of hurts their feelings if you say, I just don't like it. You have to say why you don't like it. And that, that way people try art and don't get discouraged like they did in first grade, you know? So I, this is sort of what I do, this is my process. So this is actually a picture by Laura Hale, Laura Frank Hale, who had a show in here. She takes wonderful pictures. And the thing about her pictures is she's at Prophetstown all the time. <laughs> and she gets the animals in amazing um, gestures and doing things that they don't normally do. They're usually eating horses. You know, I love painting horses, but gosh darn it, their heads are always down on the ground. <laughs> They're always eating. I'm like, come on, do something so I can paint you. Well, she got, this is Ryder out there at the Prophetstown. She got Ryder playing, he was playing in the rain. And he was he, just wonderful photographs. And she had to stand in the barn with the photographs. She's so sweet to let me use her photographs because she really takes good ones. You have to be a good photographer too. My husband is my photographer mainly. He's much better than I am. But anyway, so I, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do a series because she had several pictures of him. So I draw it. And then that is a painting with an underpainting. Um, I, that's just acrylic. And a lot of these paintings I painted, and I'm supposed to be talking about this show, but anyway, a lot of these have an underpainting. So I use, like the, uh, these blue flowers, I use blue, I mean these <laughs> yellow flowers, I use blue underpainting because they're complementary colors. Because then what happens is some of that underpainting comes out and it kind of pulls all your composition together. So you have little specks of one color throughout the whole thing. I just found this out, it's, you know, it works. So I did that and there's the, you can see some of the blue coming out from underneath the canvas. And then I did um, yeah, uh, a whole series of Ryder. So I had a lot of fun. I sold a couple of those, but I've still got two of them. Is that on sale? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just watched a Frasier where a guy calls into his radio sh show and he's, he's a car salesman. He starts talking about his cars. He goes, and now we'll have a, a, a commercial that was paid for. <laughs> so, I love Fraser. Okay. So I also I did watercolor in college. So this Christmas, I just put out there. I've tried this every year. I do animal portraits. Get an animal portrait. Da da da. Not a lot of my I hear crickets. And yet this year I had eight that I got to do in watercolor and I framed them. But I really love drawing. And so the <laughs> animals. Those are my friend's dogs. And had a ball with that. That's the um, my friend Mary, who took a class from me out at Prophetstown, her, Mary Dietrich, 
dogs. Then, uh, sometimes I like a real challenge. So there's a story behind this. The, that's a big canvas, too. That's a 30 by 40. But my husband takes pictures, and he said to me, look at this neat tractor. I'm like, yeah, it's a tractor. OK. <clears throat> you know, I'm a farmy girl, but I, I don't know. Inanimate objects just aren't my thing. So I was like, ah. So I kept looking at it. I'm like, yeah, what I don't like about it, I don't like that tire. I mean, in, the, in his picture, there's this great big tire. And, and I guess a tire's OK. I mean, compositionally, it probably would have been kind of neat to have something in the foreground and then kind of move back. But I couldn't do it. So he sat in my picture, in my millions of pictures, <laughs> for a while. And then I thought, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that again. So I pulled it up and started drawing it. And it was hard to draw, and I kind of struggled with that. Well, then I said, let's go out and take a picture of it, see if it's still there. And so it was out in Mount Morency, and I hope the people that own the property aren't here because it said no trespassing. Not that I trespassed, because the trespassing sign was right here, and I was out here. So I didn't trespass. But we went back, and here it was. And not only, I mean, this is the first picture, but this is the second picture. It had grown its tire back and its two front wheels. So I'm like, well, it was alive. It's alive. So I'm going to paint it now. <laughs> So I had so much fun. It was like, it took on a personality of its own. But you know, I, I have lots of things I do, and, and it's lots of things I don't want to do when I paint. I'm sure Dan will understand, although he's, his stuff's so clean and good. I love your stuff. But I mean, I'm like, OK, I kind of wanted to get a little abstract with it. I have a hard time doing that. I, I can't really paint abstract. I try, and it always ends up looking more realism, because I just, I just end up wanting it to look like something. But I, I mess with the trees in the background. I, I use my hands. I use my hands if I don't use a brush. And I just didn't like the way it looked because everything else was kind of clean and clear and color was thicker and brighter. And I just wanted it all to look that way. So I finally got around to making these trees darker and make the, make this a different color just to make it pop. And I don't know. It's just fun. You know, it's, I, I, I guess I like it better, but sometimes I, I don't. But my husband is all like, <laughs> Every painting will sell at some point. And, and uh, even things I don't like, people will buy. I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, this community is just, I think it's, it's just unique among communities our size because it's got so much, so much art support. I cannot believe the, the amount of support we have. We have wonderful people, patrons of the arts. We have these wonderful facilities. Um, we have just good communications with art. Um, and it's just a wonderful place to be. And I just always want to say thank you to this art museum and to TAP and to all the places, because we really do have a unique situation for a town our size. I mean, Purdue has a lot to do with it, but we're kind of our own thing over here on this side of the river. We kind of have a lot of support, even without with the, without the Purdue thing. But um, one thing that I try to do along with the shows is uh, find all the other opportunities there are. And some of them are very difficult. <laughs> Dan can test to this. Um, Hoosier Salon's hard to get. You can join the Hoosier Salon. A lot of people don't understand. You join Hoosier Salon for $60 a year. But to get in the show that's once a year is, is very difficult to do. And I've applied for it four or five times and gone in once. But that one time, I was really proud. <laughs> so I had been in the Hoosier Salon. Um, the next thing I tried to do that was also very difficult was this Indiana Artist Club. You'll see flyers around here. And Indiana Artist Club is a small group of like 150 people. It's been around for 100 years. Um, but to be a member of it, you have to be juried into three shows of their choice. And one of them is Hoosier Salon. So it's the tough stuff to get into. And then you have to be juried in. So I got into three shows, put my work, <laughs> had my little resume. I had won a couple of awards in a couple of the shows. I didn't get in. <laughs> I didn't get in. I was like, what? <laughs> I was really kind of mad, you know? But you know, it happens. They're like, try again, try again. And after my little ego, was, I had to brush it off a little bit. And it's just, this is what we deal with as artists. We get rejected. I got back in. I got in. So I did it again. We had had a um, Broadripple Art Fair, and they had had to close the fair because it poured down rain. 
This is starting to happen now. This has never happened before. Two of the fairs I was in this year, they had to shut down. We paid, Broderpool's $400 to be in, I think. Isn't it, Sally? Yeah. $400. So we paid $400 and we only got one day. We don't get money back. That was kind of a bummer. But um, So anyway, they shut it down. Then I had, this, I had to get jury done with the um, Indiana artists, so I took my stuff over there. So it wasn't a total loss. So I got into that, and they have a show. They have one member show where everybody gets to be in it, and then they have a show where it's juried, and it is at the Art Museum of Indianapolis. So I'm excited. I hope I get into that because that's kind of a, a big deal to be to be there, but not as big as it is to be here, right, Kendall? <laughs> so I hope I get in. I don't know. I think I'm going to send that one. I don't know. You think? Yeah, they only have 45. They only have room for 45 paintings, so that's why it's so hard to get into. Right, right. So no wonder. But they should give it a bigger gallery. But if they knew how hard it is to get into that club, <laughs> they should give it a bigger gallery. And then TAF, um, I had a show. It, it was a fluke. Um, I applied to be in a TAF gallery because they have the galleries. And, and, this, and I got in t two years ago or three years ago. Well, they re redid TAF. They uh, renovated TAF. So my show <laughs> moved. And I had a show, uh, it was uh, all my animal paintings at TAF at the same time I had this show, but it was only up for a little while. So I had to do sh two shows, that's why this is all flowers and that was all my animals. <laughs> so you, you, do those, you do those things, I, I guess, you know, resume builders and then people like Kendall stand up and read your little thing and you feel really proud. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, 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 I am proud of that, that was hard. That's the painting that got into the Hooter Salon, the one of um, the barns. That's Prophetstown, of course. And I just like this other one. I used my hands to do the clouds. But I, I a little bit more about how I grew up and how I became this. Um, I grew up in Crawfordsville and was always drawing, always painting. And, and I was always drawing and could draw. I could draw. I mean, you know, they say some people are gifted that way. I guess maybe. Maybe I was, or maybe it's just because I drew all the time, but I drew horses and cats. Listen to John Denver. In fact, I was listening to John Denver on the way over here. It just happened to come up. <laughs> My nickname in college was Granola Girl, okay? I was just a big nerd. But I love the outdoors. I always have. I never change. So I'm out there all the time, biking, running, and painting. So I am pretty much the same person I was. <laughs> but. Um, my dad was like, yeah, just major in art, you're fine, you're a girl, you know, you'll find a nice boy and we'll be fine. Well, I found a nice boy, but he was a poet. <laughs> so, yay! He's like, you're an artist and he's a poet, nah, you're going to starve. Guess you're going to need my support your whole life. <laughs> anyway, um, he, this is a sad story, but he, he got leukemia and he did die of leukemia. So. The other reason I say that, and one reason I tell that, is because art has always been also a really big part of my mental health, of course. We all know that if we paint. Uh, it really is helpful to be able to paint and run. <laughs> I'm really lucky because I, I have a lot of good therapy <laughs> going. I do all the things that, that help me stay sane. So I got home and was going to do the teaching art and my, my, my husband was uh, going to go to the writer's workshop, and he did. He got his master's while he was sick. But uh, we were in Iowa City, Iowa. Everybody there, it's just like here. Everybody there's an art teacher. Couldn't find a job. Ended up doing anything and everything that art majors do, which uh, 35 years of <laughs> marketing, sales, public relations. I worked everywhere in town. Name a place. Just name a place. I've worked there. <laughs> I worked at Area 4 Agency on Aging, and then I worked at the Journal and Courier. I was the assistant to Arvid Olson. Does anyone know Arvid Olson? Ah, yes, he was my boss. It was fun. But I learned marketing, and I learned like a lot of demographic stuff. It was a great company. It's a Gannett company. It was a huge company. It was wonderful. I learned all this marketing stuff, and I liked working at a newspaper. It was really fun back then. I mean, we had real stories, you know. We had to get out there, and you had to change. we'd have to change the front page, you know, like, uh, oh, um, the um, OJ trial. They had two front, I don't know if you guys know this, they had two front pages. 
So, you know, the press is all like really geared up and inked up and they're like, okay, we have to wait to see, you know, is he guilty or, you know, acquitted? And they, they held the paper and put the right one up. It was so exciting. And then another time, they had to hold the presses or they had to restart the press to get a new front page because we had a tornado. I don't know if you guys remember, we had this big tornado, well, we had several, but we had this big tornado, and um, they had they had started the press run, which was almost so fun. Go down in that room, it was <coughs> huge. Anyone ever seen the press? They don't make them like this anymore. They don't do newspaper like this. They don't even do newspaper anymore, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Hope there's no one from the Journal and Courier in here. But it was just a really fun place to work. Well then, after that, I worked at Lockett Life Insurance Company. You remember that? It went away too, but um, it was a great job. And I did, um, it was, I was a director of communications and travel. <laughs> so I did, uh, literally wrote like brochures about insurance. Uh, my dad was an insurance salesman, but it was something I knew nothing about, but I learned it. I dealt with the legal a lot. And so marketing and legal, it was a really good job. So I learned a whole bunch about that. And then I did, I was Julie the cruise director, so I did their trips. And their trips were five star, super nice trips. Uh, I, we only stayed in Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton. So now <laughs> I'm kind of spoiled, but I can stay anywhere, can I, honey? We do Airbnbs for trips, I don't care. <laughs> um, but I just five years ago started doing this. So, and it's been, it's been a real, it's been great because my husband, super supportive and he helps me put up the tent and and we meet all these great people and I sell some stuff it's kind of neat it's fun but um so there we are yeah there we are there he is this is he's oh I'm sorry <laughs> he hates it when I do this last when I did the opening when I had to think this people standing next to him go did you know she was gonna say all that <laughs> about you <laughs> he's like ah, I just no you're used to it so this is um this was um, South Bend, and uh, I had been to South Bend once, and it was an indoor show. And this is just to show you how weird this animal is. These, these art fairs are weird. So it was an sh indoor show. I sold nothing, nothing. So I had paid all this money. I mean, it's just, it's just what happens. 2D artists, it's, it's kind of tricky. People like jewelry, they like pottery, they like, but they don't have wall space. I'm all out of wall space, honey. I love your work, but I don't have any wall space. I'm like, take down the things you have and put mine up. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. So I, the, the difference between that and this, you can see, you know, this is curated by wonderful Michael. And when I walked in here, I was like, whose work is this? <laughs> I mean, it's so beautiful and he's got all the lights on it. So to be curated, has been a real honor for me. And it's just, it's a lot different. I try to make it look really great, but I do bring a lot of art to these because you never know what people are gonna want. I mean, it's like having a store, not having very much on the shelves. You gotta have a lot of stuff. And I do paint fast and I paint a lot because I have to, because I have to keep up my inventory. And so I'm not gonna sell everything, but shoot, you know, there, there may be something that sold that I may think, okay, those sold there, maybe I'll paint some more like that. It's the marketing in me. So this show was particularly great. So the one that was indoor in South Bend flop, I signed up for this leaper park and we go there and it's pouring down rain. It happens, pouring down rain the first day and still had some sales, believe it or not. People that buy art, they come out. The second day, it was beautiful and we had a lot of people and I had these guys come and they were gonna buy some stuff and I knew it. Of course, this happens all the time. It, it's like this craziness. People come in and they're like, oh, I love that, I love that, I love that, I love that, and then they walk away and they never come back. And you're thinking, wait a minute, you were gonna buy all these paintings. Well, this couple came back and they bought this one and this one. They bought those two paintings. <laughs> Sally understands. It's like, God, I was beside myself, beside myself. I thought they were kidding. They're like, we're gonna take those two. I'm like, really? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> so I did, then that was a good, great show, but you know, I could go back next year and sell nothing. I mean, that's the way this works out. I think people think, oh, that Ann, she's selling stuff all the time. No, I mean, it's okay, this has been fabulous. I was so excited to sell some stuff there, it's so exciting, but you just don't know. 
but it was a good show. And there's my wonderful guy now. Oh, okay, so we were talking about painting fast and painting a lot. And sometimes people ask me, how long does that take you? How long did it take you to paint? How, how long did it take you to paint this? And I'm like, I don't want to answer that question because I don't like it when people ask me that. It's almost like it costs an awful lot of money. If it, if you, if it was easy for you, why do you charge that much? We talked about this in class. Well, maybe that isn't what they're saying. I just read them that way. <laughs> but guys, I do paint fast sometimes. And sometimes I paint, I struggle and I struggle. And of course, there's all that overhead and all those other things, which you can't really explain to people because they don't really care. They just want to know how long it takes to paint that painting. <laughs> and it, you know, I don't know, a couple days. But the way I paint, you can't let it dry. You can't get away from it and come back to it most times. Even though oil paint takes a long time to dry, you still, it's real hard to paint over the way I paint because it's so thick. So it's like impasto, and I paint what they say a la prima, which means all at once. I paint these paintings pretty much all at the same, in the same time. So this is my favorite guy. <laughs> He's my hero. This guy painted 500 paintings for one show. He's Spanish. He painted plein air like this, like on the beach. This horse, there's the horse, there's the kid, and this, I think he had help. He had people like I bring, bringing paints to him, I don't know. And his, what I heard, and I don't see a picture of it here, but he would have, um, uh, his palette was as large as a small piano, uh, grand piano lid, that's what I heard. And he would use brushes with, have you ever heard this fan about him, about Stroya? He would use a, like broomsticks and put his brushes on the end of broomsticks. But you could see that he would have to do that in a way. I mean, he's got these people also. But he paints really fast, and I just love this. I could not paint it all if I had to paint slowly. Every effect is so transient, it must be rapidly painted. Of course, that's a plein air artist. So that's very true with plein air because you really, your light changes, and in Indiana, who knows what could happen, right? So I just, he's just kind of my hero. So I just tell people, well, I paint a lot, I paint fast, so then I tell them about Soroya, and then I tell them about Handel. Yeah, so we went to see the Messiah over here down the street. This amazing, beautiful work. I've heard it before. My parents used to drag me to Wabash to see it. I grew up in Crawfordsville, by the way. My dad went to Wabash. That's hence what I went to DePaul, because I couldn't go to Wabash, because it's all nails. <coughs> Anyway, so they drag me to Handel, to Messiah, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to listen to the Messiah. Well, this time I have more, resp more respect for music, and we went to see it. He wrote the entire Messiah in 23 days. So there you go. I went, no one asked him how long it took to write. How long did it take to write that? Wow, 23 days, I'm not gonna listen to it. Nope, not gonna listen. Okay, so plan our painting, I don't do it a lot, because I just, it's hard, the bugs, and wind, and uh, light, and heat, and all that. One time I was out painting on a trail, and I, I just, I, I don't bring a lot of stuff. These plein air painters, they, they got all this stuff, they got new chairs, big umbrellas, all this fancy stuff. I'm like, I've got an a old suitcase, and I put all my junk in there, and then I, I just have a, pretty much an easel, that's it. So I, my, palette is on the ground and I'm doing this, you know, and I lean over and this painting, and it was a big one, fell right on my back. <laughs> it had paint on it, a lot of paint on it. I was like, okay, this is one of those plein air stuff for the birds. But uh, this was out at uh, Prophetstown, and um, I, fell, I hope you <laughs> see that, but I was, I pull in next to the, um, oh, you know, the gate, gate house, and I get out of my car, the guy's kind of looking at me. What's he doing? So I kind of hike up through the weeds, looking at my place, trying to get a good shot. Ah, I think I'll paint from here. All these weeds, I'm getting all scratched up. Finally, I'm done, and I come down. And this is the actual painting, the finish, kind of there. And he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> you couldn't tell what I was. And I go, this! And I held up this painting, and this is what's so great. People are like, 
yeah, and I've studied a long time, and I work really, really hard, and I, yes, I know I'm fast, but, but it, it's worth it. <laughs> so anyway, it was really fun, because he was like freaking out. People do freak out, because this is in Paris. In Paris, everybody does that. It's no big deal. Everybody with their hat and their, and their paintbrushes, and they, they all have wine. That's so wonderful, but mm, in Indiana, you don't see it very often. This actually is not a plein air painting. It's just another painting of my wonderful favorite place on earth. And these are those spiderworts this year. They were so beautiful, just amazing. I'd never seen those. So I said that I have a background in marketing, and this really helped my art. It's really helped my art a lot. So because I, I do kind of throw my stuff out there every day. I paint every day. So I, I'm always showing new things on Facebook. I'm not sure if those things really help me sell art, but I like putting them on there. <laughs> out there it's fun so I do these little apps so that's my phone I do this for my phone and this is one where you can like put little pictures in a thing you know together and I'll say you know here's some of my birds and here's some of my, my landscapes and oh here's what this painting would look like in your house if you had a blue wall and super cool looking chairs but it's a cool app it's like you can do all these different apps and I or, uh, rooms and then you're, you're painting whatever looks good I thought that one looked really good there I wrote them. I said, you know, my art is kind of, and I wasn't doing flowers then, I was doing more animals. It, my stuff didn't look good in any of their rooms. And all of a sudden, there were more rooms. I think they listened to me. I said, I do kind of farmy stuff, and <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden, they had like rooms that looked like what my art would look good in. So I was really excited about that. And then, then you know, I promote my classes and things. These were fun. I did two little tiny paintings of this beautiful sun. That's real loose, but I really like it. You'll find that painters that paint realistically always want to get looser. <laughs> it's true. And almost every one of my class came in, and I always ask them, well, what do you want? What's your goal? And they all say, I want to be looser. <laughs> so, Because every time you get loose, you start thinking, oh, no, 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 his face isn't right. Oh, no, and I do this. And oh, and, and all of a sudden, you, you're not loose anymore. You know? They, they're like, ah, shoot, you threw it away. But, uh, oh. So I just have, I was going to show you some more animals and birds and things like that. The, um, I, I love painting birds. And they love me because they, they sit there while I paint them. No, I take pictures. But <laughs> <laughs> I just love painting birds. And then um, back to my inspiration. So <laughs> I have these wonderful students. Several of you are here tonight. And my husband, he went to Mount Fuji. He hiked Mount Fuji. That's Mount Fuji. He, before he went to Mount Fuji, he hiked this Knobstone Trail while I was at, in my tent at an art show. But he was there. How many? Ten? No, yeah, ten, ten. He hiked ten miles down in southern Indiana while I was at the Sellersburg show. It ended up being a pretty good show. And um, this is my, this guy. Um, I taught a class at, oh, I didn't tell you about that. I got a grant from Indiana Arts Commission, another wonderful thing. So do those. Gosh, they're easy to get. I wrote this thing up, and I got $2,000. And they said, yeah, we like that you're going to do this out at Prophetstown. So I taught these classes at Prophetstown. And this um, guy drove from Fort Wayne. I had two people from Fort Wayne drive all the way here. <laughs> they're probably really sorry <laughs> that they did that. But And then this is Mary, my friend Mary. She took a class, she took that class, and she paints every day. She still paints. It's like Belinda, you paint all the time. She paints every day. You probably paint every day too, don't you? Or you, you have to do all that other stuff too. <laughs> you all have jobs, darn it. Ah, jobs, they always get in the way of art. So yeah, this guy, and this was super cool. So at the end of this class, we had a show. And there, we had it there at the uh, little house when you first go in. And we had a, I put up my big panels that I have, and everybody, and he sold that painting. And I was so happy for him, because he'd been an art major, and he's like working at Kroger now, and he's like, I don't know, you know what, what am I doing? And I said, keep at it, keep at it. So he sold that painting, and I was so happy for him. Oh, that's it. Oh my gosh. We have time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty quick. I, I really don't, I mean, I guess I didn't talk much about how I did these. So if you have questions about that, 
I know this on uh, um, Yeah, go. Yes. Yeah, so I know you, you, you work really hard at marketing and, and going out to all the fairs and selling your work and probably more than anybody I know. <laughs> it's, it's really good. Do you, can artists make a living doing uh, that? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, I, you can't, I, don't, I couldn't support a family. I have a husband that has a job. Um, Dan knows. <laughs> Dan's got a, a job at Purdue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, are you retired? I escaped, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Congratulations. I just escaped. You escaped. <laughs> yeah, really. That's kind of how I felt. I worked at Purdue. I worked at Purdue, too. I stole, I, I forgot. I, I did United Way at Purdue. So I raised money for United Way. It's much more fun, more fun to raise money for yourself. Um, you have to... I think, I think you'd have to go to so many shows. And what happens is, you know, like I said, they're so, um, you just don't know. Um, I think Jerry Smith, I think Jerry Smith made a living. Now, his wife was a teacher. She supported him. But I think Jerry Smith did. And here's what's happening with, with art shows. There's too many of them. They've become 5K runs. Like, you know how people raise money with 5K runs and there's a 5K run everywhere? There's an art show, especially up around Chicago in every town, run by the same woman, her name is Amy Ander, and she runs so many art fairs that it's just saturated. So people come to these fairs and they go, oh, I'll see you next, I'll see you next week and wherever. Well, I only go to Chicago. I'm probably not gonna do many Chicago shows. But, so it's hard because it's getting saturated and also, um, gosh, there's some weird stuff. You know, with the weather, um, they're, they're getting more expensive. I mean, shows used to be what? I don't know, two hundred dollars. Have you ever done fairs? No. Yeah. Well, Jerry Smith told me to do fairs. He said, "If you want to make a living, if you want to really sell art, do these fairs." I'm one of probably maybe two people that do this in this town. Rena used to do them, but she has her gallery now, and I can't. And Sally's doing she's doing fairs, aren't you, Sally? And I, I mean, there's just not many people that do them it, because it is it's a ton of work, and you have to have a husband or a a wife that's, that's gonna support you, but but I have done I've done well. I think I've done well. I mean, I've made profit, mm -hmm. and that's with all that stuff that I have to spend money on. So, but my husband says it doesn't matter. <laughs> Lucky me, right? Anyway, anyone else? Ask questions. Yes. I can. I, I'll tell you what, um, this painting, these two paintings here, and that, yeah, the lights are off because of, the, of my presentation, but, um, oh, and look, oh, I knew I had more. <laughs> um, those two paintings I painted at the same time, and then there's a, another one that goes with that one. And my whole idea was underpainting in the opposite color, so a complementary color, and fast. Like I wanted them to, to be, to go together, to work well, all together. And it was really fun, because you can see, I mean, these do kind of go together, although I got a little different styles, but there's this blue under that. I don't like green, and this is one thing I did want to talk about, I'm glad you brought it up. I always want to try to do something besides green, because every single painting in here would look the same if I did what it usually looks like, and that's green. <laughs> Flowers have green stems most times, and leaves. So I did this underpainting and I, and I put the flowers over them for those. Um, this one, this is my favorite one, and I don't know. It was the photograph. It was a great photograph. Mike and I were out there one day and um, the light was neat and I knew it would look good and I knew that if I, uh, this is super, super dark. So that's always good when you're gonna paint this color. Like this is a super hard color. Now, I always tell my students, you have to mix your purples, but I lie, because there are colors in a tube. <laughs> this is a, a magenta, and probably pure magenta, and this is probably sort of a dioxin purple, something like that. Purples are tough, so I mix most of my color, but some of these are just right out of the tube. And it worked because of this dark pattern, and then the light, and then uh, the way those yellows pop. So this one, I'm not sure I had an underpainting, but a lot of these I did. 
Um, I had so much fun with the show because I'm not a botanist. I know nothing about flowers, but I bought a book. And so I come home and I go, okay, that's a, uh, and this is neat. This is called Queen of the Prairie, which I consider myself <laughs> at this point. So I love this. And it was just so interesting. It had red, just lovely. So see, it's all yellow here and green here. Just I really struggled. Uh, I really challenged myself to use a different background color. The one back there, the blue and the orange, blue and orange, it just really worked. And that, I mean, I'm telling you some of my secrets here. That I was really frustrated with. So I scraped, um, I had already done the painting, and this happens a lot, I waste a lot of paint. I scraped off, and I thought, can't do that. Well, who says? So I decided it's my painting. If I want to scrape off, I'll scrape off. So I've scraped off parts of that, and it looks really good. So I kept it. And then I put orange, more orange back in there. It's, ah, that's good. it's blue and orange look good together. And then that other one, that, that's blue lobe, lobia, lobelia, lobelia. Yeah, and hori vervain, vervain, hori vervain, <laughs> that purple one. That's that crazy. So, yeah, a lot of times it's so funny because I struggle so much with the foregrounds. Foregrounds are not my thing. So I paint all this stuff, and then I'm like, ah, I'm tired. I don't want to do the foreground. I don't know. Why is it hard? I don't know. Because it's because it, it kind of, it's because I do paint representationally. The foreground leaves should look like leaves, but I don't want to paint leaves. So I don't want to paint leaves. So I struggle sometimes. But I knew I knew yellow would look good. So that's kind of that art thing about I have to have that. So I did this yellow. This one, Thrash, I really like that one. There's that one I scraped a few sticks. This one was fun because I just think, <laughs> well, gold and blue. <laughs> My high school colors are gold and blue. <laughs> Crawfordsville Athenians. So this just was so fun. So this is goldenrod and blue lobelia. Great blue lobelia. <laughs> I love saying those little names. <laughs> and then, because this is the one that I did the yellow underpainting, and then the purple on top. I have two of these. And you can see, it's just underpainted with yellow. This was the very first one I did for this show. I remember sending it to Michael. So I just really, <laughs> this is really kind of crazy. But I, I really did this color thing because I didn't want to use green. I didn't want, I wanted blue and yellow and purple. Those are like triad colors or something. I do use the color wheel. <laughs> I mean, it's so silly because I think a lot of people, I mean, I didn't really use the color wheel in college. I don't remember them teaching me the color wheel in college. I don't remember them teaching me any of it. It could just be because I don't remember. I'm old. But, but yeah, these were, oh, oh, and these, so these long skinny ones, they all kind of go together. They're so fun together. Like, I can't wait to have them in a show because they're good. They just look super neat. Like, they look perfect over your couch. See what I mean? I'm always <laughs> so, <laughs> so these were super fun and I really had a great time making these ones that go together. So I love I love doing the series thing and it works really well at art fairs and things. So any more questions? Please ask me more. Yeah, can you tell more about the use of foreground that you do like oh. everything is in a mixture of like fifty fifty mm. how do you do that? We well, see how I am kind of hyper and kind of flighty and kind of, so I, I want to do this. So this is how I want to do it. Do as I say, not as I do. So you're supposed to use like 25% coal wax with your paint. So I do that some. <laughs> and there's a lot of times when I, I just want to put paint on and I don't, I don't mix the wax, but you're supposed to use 25% wax. And what it does, it thins the paint a little bit. If you use too much, it, it's like, it gets really thin, sort of like, if you put turpentine or whatever, you know, linseed oil or one of those, I don't use any of that stuff. But yeah, it, it does that. Um, and then the other thing it does is, of course, it gives it all this texture, all this thickness. If you use a lot, you know, and you can play with it and say, okay, that's too much. Or sometimes I, I just use pure paint and just kind of put it on there. But <laughs> then I think, ah, oh, that's expensive. So, <laughs> um, so, but then it dries quickly. So when you use a cold wax, I don't know why, just because it's a, a thinner, it will dry faster. So you have to be kind of careful. And I, if I leave it out, it'll dry. It'll dry overnight. I, I won't be able to 
use the paint, and I definitely won't be able to paint anything over the painting. If I run into trouble, if I come back and want to fix something, which I don't usually do because it just doesn't work, um, I'll scrape it. I'll just take my palette knife and just scrape it off. I mean, I've scraped whole paintings off, me painting them. <laughs> You were doing that, and I, I've heard what I do is freeze them. So okay. I have a palette, I have a glass palette, and uh, I've just learned all this stuff from just you know what other artists have been doing. But I just put it in the freezer. I put it in like a uh, like a palette, um, it's actually an acrylic palette, and I put, it's got a lid, and I just put it in the freezer. And I don't know, I I don't know. Do you know if that's bad for your paints or? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you I know, Susan. Yeah. yeah, you know Susan Doster. Well, Susan Doster is a super, super like New York trained artist, and she knows a lot about paint. She knows about chemical stuff. She probably mixed her own at one time. And I know people who do make their own paint. Unbelievable, but they do. It's their, it's their thing. <laughs> it's their jam. Mm -hmm. Hi, I make my own paint. Oh, you you wouldn't believe some of the stuff at art fairs. It's the people have these like little gimmicky things, which I need to do because I think the palette knife thing is kind of fun. But no, I'll have some kind of. <laughs> Hers is that she makes her paints, and um, but um, it's um, what, was I, what was I going with that? Hmm. Freezing, freezing. Hmm. Freezing. freezing them. Okay, that was it. So I don't. I think that when I if I worry about that stuff, like Susan would say, you know, she says you shouldn't paint under painting acrylic because it could it could crack. But I'll be long gone <laughs> before <laughs> any of my paintings crack or fade. So another thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, so I'm sorry, I'm dead now. Did my painting crack? I'm sorry. You know, the Mona Lisa is cracked, by the way. I think she's got like, cracks all over her face. Call it up. Tell them to come back down here and fix that. So I do worry some about um, fading, but not much, because I don't really think oil paints fade. I mean, I've read, I get them out in the sun at shows, and I think, oh, God, this can't be good for these paintings, but you read about it. It's like, yeah, you know, it's not great, but it's not going to hurt them. But it's just it makes you worry about them. But you can um, varnish. Do you varnish? Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't varnish. I don't have time to varnish. You must wait. Yeah, you have to wait six months, they say. But it's, you don't have to wait right. six months. Right. So varnish, and if I varnished, I would use a spray varnish, and it would be matte, because I really don't want shiny, especially with all this texture I get. So after I get these paintings down, I am going to varnish them all because I really don't want anything to happen to these paintings. They were at the Art Museum of Greater Lafayette, and I do not want anything to happen to them. I will varnish. I will, and when I think about it, I do varnish them. And when I sell them, a lot of times I'll say, this has not been varnished. If you want me to varnish it, I'll come and varnish it <laughs> in three months. <laughs> um, and they don't usually take me up on that because uh, I don't think they, I don't think, that's what's so great about oil paint. Oil paint's pretty bad. But but Susan would probably say, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> but she's wonderful, though. She's a she's a very talented lady. So yes. I'm so glad you guys asked me questions. Several times. So I started out in college, I did um, watercolor, because Jerry, Sm Jerry Smith was one of my dad's best friends and one of my best friends, and he was my mentor, really. You can kind of tell in that one painting. In fact, I have a funny story about that, but anyway. Um, so Jerry taught me to do watercolor, and in college, um, they considered, my professors considered watercolor a craft. They did not, yeah. I was like, really? Okay. Because you could splatter and you could scrape, and I'm like, wow, I'm really doing craft now because I'm scraping. And, but they considered it a craft, and so they didn't really have a lot of respect for watercolor. I don't know why, because it's really, really hard. But um, so I did watercolor, and when my husband was sick and and all that was going on with him, I, I did a lot of watercolor paintings. I'm giving to people, you know, a um, lot of uh, landscape, uh, even some some structural stuff, some architectural stuff. I like, I kind of like that, that look. I like street scenes and stuff, but I don't paint them right now. I'm always, there's always something else I want to do. So then 
when I started doing this, somehow I got on, oh, I took a class from Michael Slonan and David, David Slonan, and then I started playing around with pastels, and I really liked these pan pastels. Remember when I was doing that? So I taught it here. So pan pastels look like um, makeup. They look like rouge. They come in these little round pans, and, and you open them up, and then you use these little sponges. They look like makeup sponges. I mean, go figure. And you and it was like a cross between drawing and painting. I loved it, because it, it was real soft, you lay it on. And then I got into kind of stick, soft stick pastels, but I did pastels. For the first time I was in around the fountain, I, I had pastels. But, and I did animals, and same, same kind of things that I paint now. But um, what happened was, <laughs> my dear friend, Jamie Peters at Art of Framing. She has this wonderful glass called Museum Glass. And I used Museum Glass to frame and put up my, well that stuff is three times more expensive than regular, and it's actually more than that. It's ridiculous, like an eight by 10 piece of Museum Glass is like $60, <laughs> really expensive. But oh man, once you use it, you can't go back. It has no glare. I mean, people would walk up and go, is there glass on? And don't touch it, don't touch it, because there's fingerprints there. But I got, I started using museum glass. It was killing me. I couldn't make a profit using museum glass, but I couldn't go back. Plus, pastels are super duper flaky, like you can't spray them, it ruins the color. Pastels are just really difficult for doing shows. <laughs> They're beautiful and wonderful, and I love them, but I'll have to be like not doing shows and do pastels again, because I couldn't, couldn't afford to do them, but I love doing them. And then I started doing oils. Of course, you just throw a frame on an oil paint, and they're tough, and you know, I'm, the frames get banged up, and I hate that. Boy, that's really frustrating, because they're not cheap. These are these, so I use these floater <coughs> frames, right? These things, and they're, I don't know why, but they're really expensive. It's, it's kind of the in thing, so you use a floater frame, and they cost too much, so. I still keep thinking my husband's going to start making my frames for me <laughs> when, he, when he retires. But um, So I, I started doing the frames, and I always use black, and that's just because like, I love to use other things. But when you're in this situation where you have so many paintings hanging, you really want to make it as simple and, and, and consistent as you can. So I use pretty much all the same. Now, I, now when I sell a painting, uh, and they'll say, what frame do you want? I'll order you a frame and I'll get different things. And there's a lot of times when I'm like, gosh, I, sh I would love to use a gold frame on that, but it'll stand out like a sore thumb in my tent. You know, it'll look good. But now I'm pretty much, um, you know, flowers and animals. And I don't know where I'm gonna go from here. I still wanna get more abstract. I wanna be able to just light form and just, because people love that because, and here's why, David Michael Sloman told me. So we like pattern, again, because of our prehistoric brain. We like to see a pattern because it's something that's familiar or it's, it's safe. So that's why we have um, rhythm in art. That's one of the principles of, of design. People like rhythm. People like pattern. People like large blocks of color, of course, in a good composition. So when you see a painting and it's just, they've just hinted at something, like there's that bird's head, and look at the light, I mean, the light, the light play on figures, things like that. You'll see that, it seems to me that the paintings that really get people, that really people love, are these paintings where they've caught, they've caught something without actually drawing it or painting it perfectly, it's just like they've caught it and it's really hard to do. And back to the beginning, it's all about drawing. So if you're going to draw, I was gonna put something up there. Let me get something up there. Let me see. Hey, tall man, can you pull, pull that down here? I'm gonna show him. Show him. Thank you, tall man. <laughs> um, so if you, oops. This is gonna go back to the, well now I have to turn that light off. No, it lights off, okay. Um, I'm just trying to 
find an example. Oh, I think I'm going to go to my animals again because I looked at this today. Um, where's this birds? All right, we'll use him. He's really good. So he made a mark. Wow, that horse is with her. <laughs> that little horse is with her. He's with her. And he knew exactly what he was doing. Like he made that mark. He probably never had to make it again. I would have to go, uh, uh, uh. Well, not anymore, but I used to. So when you when you get really good at light and shadow and stuff, it's because you, you, you've seen it and you draw it right. So you don't have to put a lot of paint on it. It doesn't have to look like a photograph. And people love it. And people love abstract art because it's pattern and it's something. And it could be nothing, but they love it for whatever reason. We don't know why. It's super subjective. Yeah, subjective. But it's probably because of a, of a really nice play of light or light and dark or pattern or, you know, rhythm or it's all that principles of art. And it, and it works. So when you're drawing and you're, and this is always my challenge. Like my husband even said, oh, I don't have that pain. But um, he said, oh, here, with watercolor, you have to, you have to draw with that. Because this stuff you can't fix. Like you just have to has to be right, so you have to be a good drawer usually to do watercolor. But um, my husband said to me, um, I was I had these oil sticks. I'm still trying to find. Am I going back or forward? Okay, yeah. So I was I was really proud of these because I the little gesture and the light in their feathers and the heads and just trying to get it right without having to do it over and over again. Anyway, so my husband says. All those oil sticks. Have you ever done oil sticks? So there's this wonderful stuff called the oil sticks. And they're like these great big crayons, but they're goopy oil. And they're very, very, very goopy. But I was playing with them, and I had this photograph of a squirrel. And it was really great to photograph. My husband took it. So it, I'm doing it. And he says, do this. And he goes, paint that in 100 strokes and don't touch it again. So <laughs> I'm like, OK. So I have my sticks. And I'm like, one, two, three. I didn't really count, but I know it wasn't many more than 100. And it, it was great. And there was a, one more thing I did do, though. I had to put a little white speck on his eye. But just trying to challenge yourself to just make marks, but make them really, be really determined with the mark. And, and that is really, that really does come from practice. I'm just being able to do it. And I'm sitting here, oh, yeah, I'm so good at it. I'm not. I mean, I'm learning, and I'm getting better, but, but that's, that's, the hard thing about about doing about doing art that you're proud of. You want it to be a certain way, and you might like it, but you probably don't because I'm never satisfied. So, anyway, yes. So what I hear about uh, your love for horses and yeah. how you treat it, hmm? and how they're a huge inspiration and training for both of us. How they're what? Like horses. I'm sorry. Oh God, they've always inspired me. I told you I love John Denver and Colorado and all that. Um, horses, to me, this is my thing. They are this huge animal, and they're like children. So if you could control them, it feels really good. But they're very sweet. There's a special on horses on PBS, I think. Is that PBS? We watch a lot of PBS. And it's just fascinating. They, they ate them at first, OK? They ate horses because they're like, hey, these are big animals. Let's kill them and eat them, because that's what you have to do, you know? Well, then they realized they weren't very tasty, <laughs> but they're really sweet. And they were and they were like dogs. They would come up, and they rub you, and they love you, and they become very, they're very they can be taught. And I, it's just this whole thing with horses and man, the way that we evolve. I love uh, animals, but. Horses, I guess, I never had a horse. I wanted a horse. My dad would come home every day. And until he had his drink, <laughs> I couldn't ask him. But he'd come home, and I'd go, can I have a horse every single day? And he'd say, no. Give me a drink. No. He'd say, no. You cannot have a horse. How about an alligator? He'd say that. And then, or he, he would always want to, he was a great dad. He was a great dad. He was always getting me things, but I never got a horse. But I got every other animal. <laughs> One day he brought home banny roosters. This is before chickens were a big thing. Now they're like the thing. Everyone's got to have chickens. Well, he brought home these these chickens and a rooster, and they were called bannies. My mom's like, what? And we had five acres, but we, we really were not a chicken farm. 
yeah. So I mean, I just, um, I like them because they're like a, I like to I like to comb them. I like to put all this tack on them. But I like to ride bareback because it's so much fun to feel that, just that strength of the, and they're so beautiful. I'm a runner. My husband's a runner. I just love the way they run. I can't watch the Kentucky Derby without bawling my eyes out. And to hear that they're abused and all that, I just, yeah, I hate that. But anyway, I love him. I don't know what else to say. You love, you love dogs. <laughs> I, I have a cat. I, I don't have a dog, but yeah, I like horses a lot. <laughs> I never outgrew that, I guess. Anything else? I guess that's it. Thank you, Lori. I've bored you long enough. <laughs>